Hello, my name is David Thorpe and I'm the Special Consultant on Sustainable Cities Collective, the foremost web space for urban leaders everywhere. Now, greening a city is a task with many aspects and today we're talking to someone with experience of several of these. Patricia Lee's job description is as a certified energy manager and director of New York-based consultancy Code Green. And her job is about making buildings more efficient with leads. But she wears two other hats being involved with a project to improve air quality in US cities and another to do with community gardens in New York City. Hello, Patricia. Hi, David. How are you? Hi, David. Hi. Now, firstly, you're involved with a non-profit organization called the Urban Air Foundation that's dedicated to improving the air quality in American cities. So who do you work with to achieve this? Uh, mainly we work with the private real estate market and the leaders uh, within that market that are really focused on making some changes uh, in the built environment. Um, oftentimes, you know, within the private sector, it's hard to sort of take risks, push the envelope, implement innovative solutions, um, and be sort of the guinea pig. So, you know, there are lots of people within uh, the real estate market here in New York City that have a real passion for sustainability. So we've developed sort of urban air uh, as an action tank to allow those people to kind of participate and push ideas um, and really start to make some differences um, in the air quality in, in urban areas. One of the things that we're, we're, we're looking into doing is creating better corridors for uh, bikes and pedestrians. So, you know, lobbying the city um, to start creating some of these very uh, traffic heavy corridors to expanding the sidewalks, expanding the bike lanes, making it safer for pedestrians and bikers, therefore encouraging more of it across the city. So, you know, at the um, city and government level, we're, we're rallying together to really lobby and try to push for initiatives like that. Great. Now let's talk about community urban gardens, because you're helping to design a self-sustaining kit that can serve as a replicable model in these gardens. What mm -hmm. is this kit like? Uh, so we're working with a great team um, with the Architects 10 Architectos who have done a great job in terms of the number of iterations they put together to develop this kit of parts. Um, you know, it, the idea of being using renewable energy with solar panels, rain catchment, um, and making it very replicable, easy to build, um, and something that can also be uh, adjusted and modified to each site uh, relatively easily. So it's gone through uh, you know, a, a rigorous design process. Um, they've done a lot of great work and we're hoping you know, for this year we'd be able to, to, to do our first pilot. And who are you working with to achieve this? Um, we're working with the New York Restoration Project. They manage um, a large number of community gardens within uh, the New York City area, and so they have a great footprint and a great need for this kind of thing. So uh, it's been great um, being in partnership with them and developing uh, this casita uh, with their input as well as input of the, of the design team. So this is connected to the Million Trees NYC campaign, is it? Um, it's not directly connect, connected with the Million Trees NYC. I mean, NYRP does a lot in terms of uh, uh, planting trees. So yes, in, in that way, uh, it does help towards that Million Trees campaign. Um, we did have a tree planting last year, giant trees that we, <laughs> that we were planting. Um, and so I think we made a little dent towards that Million Trees goal. What kind of community reaction do you have when these, these projects happen on the ground? Um, for the Casita project, uh, we've had some really great uh, community reaction. I think it's it's definitely a need um, within the community to have a place where people can gather. Um, the particular garden that we are piloting the Casita in is a very uh, much used garden. They have um, a lot of uh, uh, plants that they're growing there. Um, uh, crop that they're growing there and it serves as a, a, a rally for um, community parades as well. Um, so it's it's something that I think in terms of getting power uh, that can be used there, um, lights, things like that and have it be self-sustaining is going to be um, you know a huge help and, and definitely we're working in hand, hand in hand with the community as the casita is being developed. Do any of these gardens contain allotments? 
allotments. Can you? Oh, sorry, that's an English term. An allotment is a plot of land that you have somewhere else in the, in the city that belongs to you or that you can use to grow your own food. Um, they 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 are definitely use it as a community garden um, where you're growing food and vegetables, all that uh, within that community garden. Yes. Mm. Okay. Um, so, uh, going back to the Millennium Trees campaign, how, do you know how many trees have been planted already and whether they're going to achieve their objectives? I think they're very close to achieving it. I, on the Million Trees website, they have a ticker that, that constantly gets updated. I want to say it's in the uh, 800,000. Yeah, it's 806,911. So, uh, it looks go, like right? we're, we're getting very close. It's still a way to go. It's <laughs> only 30% of the way there. 30% of the way, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, and, and, and can we trust this number, do you know? I mean, does it, is it actually reflective of what's really happening on the ground and it's not greenwash? I believe so. I mean, there's been a huge initiative for, for uh, tree planting. Um, there's also a lot of easy ways that you can get involved with the tree planting in terms of volunteering. I think uh, one thing that's been done that's been great is being able to sort of pair people who want to volunteer with a lot of the, the, the tasks at hand around the city. Um, so, uh, you know, I would think that that's a pretty, a pretty good number there. So I mean, the Bloomberg, Bloomberg was a numbers guy, so. Yeah. So the Bloomberg initiative, uh, also involved buildings, didn't it? Uh, creating standards for buildings and implementing them. Do you think this is going to continue, uh, with the new administration? I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Someone had just walked into the, uh, the room. <laughs> um, uh, now Bloomberg has gone, do you think the initiatives that he put into place are going to continue? I think so. He set a really solid uh, groundwork uh, in terms of legislation and long-term goals for the city. Um, definitely a lot of what he did was a boon for our industry and the sustainability and energy efficiency um, market. Uh, you know, he developed the 2030 plan to reduce carbon emissions by 30% by 2030 um, and had really a, a holistic approach to the way that, that we can get there. And so uh, in terms of a lot of the legislation that he passed or, um, while he was mayor, I think a lot of that is going to continue. So tell me a bit about the work that you do um, with making buildings LEEDS compliant. Sure. So uh, we work mainly in the commercial real estate market um, in urban areas. So uh, here in New York City, um, we work with building managers, building owners, um, taking a look at the way they operate their buildings um, and seeing what we can do to make it more energy efficient uh, and sustainable. So we do things from energy auditing, um, retro commissioning, uh, lead certifications, um, we work both in existing buildings, so in looking at how are you operating this building and how can it be optimized, as well as working with new construction um, from ground up. We're actually working with the design team to implement um, uh, systems that are efficient, um, working with the energy model to see, you know, for a particular place, what are the systems that work best um, with the given climate um, and the given orientation. Um, and so, you know, we work really uh, on a gamut of, of projects uh, and building types. Now, many of uh, the standards that um, building managers can implement are not mandatory, are they? They're voluntary, uh, but some are. Does that vary from city to city in the United States? Uh, it does vary city to city. I think now a lot of the major cities are starting to kind of catch up um, with each other. I think New York City was definitely a pioneer <clears throat> with a lot of the uh, legislation that was passed here. Uh, for example, um, energy benchmarking. Uh, New York City really started uh, that as a requirement for all buildings um, larger than 50,000 square feet, uh, having to disclose their, inf their energy usage information and energy star score, uh, which allows the marketplace to start really looking at buildings based on energy efficiency, um, because all that disclosed information is now made public. Um, since New York City has passed that, um, a lot of the other major metropolitan areas have, have followed suit. Now you have uh, DC, San Francisco, Seattle, um, Philadelphia, uh, Austin, a lot of these cities now um, pass similar legislation requiring um, energy benchmark 
marking across uh, buildings. So, so presumably you think that it should be mandatory? I think it is a great way to trigger the market. Um, it's a, a great way to kind of level the playing field across um, different buildings uh, to, to, to make it something that, that's discussed when a tenant is moving into a new building um, or a uh, leasing agent is looking to lease uh, space in a building. Um, to be able to kind of talk about uh, energy efficiency as part of that whole conversation really starts incorporating it and getting some market transformation going, um, you know, in the real estate market. Presumably building managers and owners think it's going to cost them a lot of money. Uh, are they surprised when they find out how much they can save? Yes, I mean, uh, in terms of energy efficiency, actually, it's it's not a hard sell for us. Uh, everyone knows that energy prices are, are going up. Everyone knows that, you know, it really makes financial sense to do what you can to run efficiently and use less energy. I think there was a time where it was, you know, a harder sell. It was something that people had to be convinced of. Um, now it's, it's sort of, okay, we got to do this. It makes sense. Um, what can we do to start? spending less on our energy um, and and you know I, although it is something that is now required in New York City um, buildings are required to do an ASHRAE level 2 energy audit every 10 years um, as well as retro commissioning every 10 years uh, it's something that it's less of a fight to get through now um, everyone kind of sees what that be the benefit is of doing those kinds of engineering studies at their buildings. That's terrific and you've mm -hmm. produced a free app to make jobs even easier for energy managers haven't you? Yeah, so we uh, developed an app based on all this legislation that's been um, passed uh, relatively recently across the metropolitan areas that uh, actually make public um, energy performance across buildings. So, you know, all, there's all this great data, but it's sort of how accessible is the data, how usable is the data. So what we've done is, is taken all of that public data and put it into an app that makes it easily searchable by city. Um, to see how the building is performing against sort of the average uh, building in that area. Um, so we, we developed a code, code Green Energy app that you can download uh, and can use on either an Android or an iPhone and, and quickly and easily search your buildings. Right now we only have uh, New York City, San Francisco, and Seattle on there, but as more cities make their data public, we'll be adding those cities as well. Thank you very much for talking to us, Patricia. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to stop that and just say one more. Th yeah. What do you ask them to do? The free energy app is available on the web website. You can see on the screen in one moment's time. Uh -huh.